Insight is a word that we use that means um, what well, insight, seeing into a thing. It's not just what you immediately have presented to you. Yeah. Um, there's a sort of uh, uh, where consciousness penetrates the uh, all the different experiences and works out the principles behind them. Human beings have got this amazing capacity to do that. And it's why we're so successful. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when I was a kid, uh, I didn't have that faculty very well. I didn't like to brush my teeth and I didn't like to go to the dentist. One was just a bit boring and unpleasant. And the other one was a man that hurt me. Why, why would you ever do either? Yeah. Some years later, now, I still don't particularly like going to the dentist, but I... I understand the processes that are at play there so that I want to go to the dentist, even though the actual experience of going there in itself has no value to me. Yeah. So uh, I have had an insight into oral care. <laughs> it works, yeah. Um, so we, we, we replace simple perceptions with deeper understandings. That's what human beings do. Um, and because of that, that deeper understanding allows our actions to be more in line with reality. And so we're more successful. That's how it works. We make better decisions because of it. So there are different types of insight. Um, there's mundane insight, and that is um, um, insight into day-to-day -day stuff we call common sense. Uh, insight into objects, we say someone's practical. Uh, insight into your body, you might say someone's grounded. Uh, or if they have a greater insight into their character, you might say they've done personal development or their psychological growth or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Um, uh, insight into others, you say they're empathic. Uh, insight into the material world, you might say they've got a PhD in physics. We've got all these different uh, spheres, these different categories of life and, uh, and reality, and they each have particular wisdoms or particular insights um, about them. And we value insight. Uh, we pay people more who have uh, experience and who are qualified because we value, we, we understand that that's a value. Yeah? Um, my, my dad uh, once told somebody uh, at the pub that uh, someone had hit his car and, and left and um, he had to fix this dent in his car. And this guy says, oh, I'll, I'll fix it for you, 50 quid. And he said, oh, all right, because um, that's pretty cheap because there's a lot, a lot of stuff to be done. Um, and he said, oh, do you want to show me now? So he said, oh, oh, okay. So he went out to the car park, showed him the dent in the car. And this guy looked at the dent. He sort of looked at it from several angles and he tapped it. And he said, can I have a look at the dent from the other side? I said, yeah, all right, okay. So opened the door and he took the door panel off so he could see the metal. And then he went over to the, um, the hedgerow and he got a log, come back to the car with a log and he went bonk and the dent went and it was fine. And this guy had been a sheet metal worker for 40 years. And he then said, oh, great, well, where's my 50 quid? And my dad said, oh, that was like, five quids worth of work he said no 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 to hit it that was five quid to know where to hit it it was 45 quid <laughs> <laughs> now the implication is you can be like that with your own mind you can be like that with your own mental states instead of having to like churn around that thing that you you do the right the right effort in just the right place at the right time 
having summed it up, having really had a look at what's going on, you can just, you, you have the capacity to shift your mental states quite quickly. Children do it uh, before they've got a, a sort of um, a condensed identity and narrative. Children can go from one emotion to another in moments. Like, we can all do it, yeah? Um, hopefully with a little more awareness than what happens with children, but... So, if a... Uh, a consultant, uh, a, a consultant surgeon was on my right with 30 years experience and three PhDs. And there was somebody who uh, works at co-op on my left. Who would be best to um, uh, ask the advice of? Is it what advice? advice? Exactly. What, what advice? So... What we come down to with mundane insight is that if you want to know where the P's are, you ask this chap. And if you want to know uh, what to do with brain surgery, you ask this consultant here. So the thing about what that defines mundane insight is that it's specific. It's for a specific purpose in a specific place uh, and maybe at a specific time. I mean, you know, there's usually a bit of breadth around that. Someone who's a surgeon in your brain can probably take your kidneys out. As well. who, who knows? But um, it's particular. Now, there's another area of, uh, of insight that's called transcendental insight. Now, uh, this is according to the Buddhist tradition. I am not speaking from experience. Um, uh, there are certain things that are relevant to every field of experience that are relevant at all times, in all places, always. Anywhere in the conditioned universe, in, in this universe, uh, that is the case. Um, so they transcend categories of finding the peas or brain surgery. It transcends all categories, and so we call it transcendental insight. Yeah. These are expressed in lots of different ways, but generally the four ways that the Buddhist tradition elucidates them, let's say, these aren't the insights, these are just words, but um, they are that all things are conditioned. So all things, whether it's a black hole or an emotion, doesn't matter, anything, uh, comes from prior causes that bring it into being, yeah? And it in turn will condition other things. Mm -hmm. Everything's impermanent. An emotion and a black hole, impermanent. Um, they, they change or they end. Everything that is created ceases at some point. They're insubstantial, which is a curious one, I don't think I can really be like three talks in it in, in itself, just this one, but I would say it's substantial means really that there's nothing that solely creates itself. There's nothing that stands alone outside of this network of relational objects in the universe. Everything's, well, not everything's connected. A lot of things are connected um, and influence each other, but there's nothing that stands outside of that, is, the, is what's said. And the last one is that all things are unsatisfactory, and that doesn't mean that we can't have pleasure or be satisfied to some degree. It's definitely the case, it's evidently the case. But ultimately, nothing can be relied on for the complete resolution of our desire. There's nothing, there's no particular permutation of events that can resolve that. Yeah. So those are the four things that are said are applicable to Saturn, um, um, politics, uh, this lectern, everything. Yeah. So now you know them, you're sorted. 
but that's not really how it goes. Um, <laughs> because the uh, Sanger actually has been fa fairly famously said the central koan or the central problem of the spiritual life is to find emotional equivalents for our intellectual understanding. Yeah. So it's not enough that we know those four things. We need to act in accordance with them, but trust in them, I would say, place, uh, uh, bet on them, uh, bet on them with our actions and our lives and our energy, yeah? Live through them, emotionally engage with them. So really, I, I don't, the, the, the four, the, the three lakshanas and conditionality, that's, that's sort of a bit of a side for this talk. That is, I think that's important, and I wanted to mention those, but really what I'm interested in is the emotional process that goes on with insight, and that's any insight. That's uh, mundane insight, learning how to do brain surgery, or it's transcendental insight, learning how to um, engage in a radically different way with reality. So insight of any kind requires you to explore something beyond your current experience, beyond the habitual, beyond the known, beyond the safe. You've got to, uh, there's no way to do it uh, completely safely. You don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. Now, there's a story that I tell quite often because it's very important to me. I once thought that I wasn't engaging with uh, mindfulness in an embodied way. Um, and that's actually, that, that's kind of a Buddhist reason that I gave for it. That's a lot of nonsense. I, I, was, I, was sort of, <laughs> I was a bit frustrated. I just, I just wanted something. You know, when you sort of get tired of your own character, you know, it's just like, oh, God, it's me again. <laughs> like, you, you, you just, it, it's, it's like the butterfly that's too bound up in the cocoon. Like, I've just got to get out of this. Like, so anyway, I justified it for the Buddhist reason. But anyway, what I did was I went to a dance class. I don't, I don't dance. I don't like that. Well, I didn't. Um, I went there and I got there 15 minutes early. And it was hell because I sat there uh, and I was really nervous, very, very anxious. <clears throat> and after about 10 minutes, I thought, well, you know, you, you've been doing this mindfulness malarkey for God knows how long now. You may as well do some of it now and see if it makes it any better. So I sat there and there was a, there was like a, jittery resonant feeling in my belly my heart was going uh, my, my breaths were quite quick uh, I had a feeling in my feet and my legs like I wanted to move like you know get out of there um, I was hyper aware I was just you know I, I just knew exactly what was going on around me so anyway started the class and it was really easy. So just go from this foot to that foot. So I did. So I'm doing it. <laughs> I can do this, yeah? And it slowly built up. It was very good. It was a beginner's class. And um, probably about 40 minutes in, I thought, okay, um, I'm just going to be mindful again. I'm just going to work out what was going on. There was a sort of bubbly, jittery feeling in my belly. My heartbeat was increased. My breaths were quick. I was hyper aware of the situation and I felt very light and springy in my legs. It was exactly the same damn sensation. It's the same thing, yeah? But this time I was excited. I was well up for it. I really liked it. Now, the difference between anxiety and exhilaration, the, the difference is whether you lean backwards away from it or whether you lean forwards into it. It's the only damn difference. I consented to it. I want what, what was happening to me, I wanted to happen. Whereas at the start, I didn't want it to happen. 
so by the end, I was just allowing my experience to be whatever it was. Oh, yeah, the, the, the other thing that was different physically is at the start, um, before I was dancing, my head was down. I was like that. Um, in the class, my head was up. That was the only physical difference that I could tell. I mean, I was jumping around and sweaty at that point. Well, I should have sweaty in both situations. <laughs> um, so you don't know what you're going, what's going to happen when you put yourself in reality's way, when you open up to... Well, you can't really put yourself in reality's way. You open yourself up to a new experience and something may present itself. That's all you do. It's a bit like fishing. You just put your rod in the water and if a fish bites, a fish bites. Yeah? But the concern is that you, you may wake up, wake up in a completely different world or you may wake up as a completely different person. Um, I did the metabarvana once and I come out of it a vegetarian. I was not expecting that. I didn't particularly want that. It was really inconvenient. What? I, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, I was on retreat with somebody some years ago. Um, guy married for about uh, 10 years. He got three kids. He found out during the course of a two week retreat that he was gay. What the hell did you do with that? It's the truth. You know, was it better that he didn't know that? I mean, he certainly resisted it. You know, like he certainly didn't like that that was the case, but he was damn sure that that was the case. Um, and not just inconvenient, or well, not necessarily inconvenient, but not necessarily disruptive things. Um, uh, yeah, I've uh, a retreat some time ago. I. Uh, realized that my my body was worthy of care. And that's great. I mean, that was actually, actually that was quite disruptive um, to my self-view, to my routine, to my, you know, I, there was another thing to take responsibility for that I had not had before. And so this is, this is big stuff. And these are just mundane insights into my, my character, uh, my situation, these things that, you know, the uh, um, tango dancing, you know, like it's, these are mundane insights and there's a, there's a consequence to them, yeah? Um, reflecting on the nature of reality has wider implications than that. But what I'm most interested in is the difference between this with my head down and this with my head up. Like what, what's the, what happened between those two things? And I'm still working that out. I don't really know. Um, I, I know. I know interest is part of it. I know that commitment is part of it. The fact that I had turned up and paid, that I wasn't just going to leave. I, there was a degree of commitment there. Um, forgetting myself. Um, and the other bit, yeah, was, was being fed up being fed up of the status quo, being tired of the same old, actually. So the last part of the talk is two poems. Uh, one is called The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. And that is about uh, somebody who has had a refuge in uh, a character called Lenore. We don't know anything about Lenore. Uh, and that has worked out as a, it hasn't worked out for one his mother. Again, we don't know. But it's him coming into contact with impermanence and unsatisfactoriness, I'd say. And the, uh, the, the instrument that brings that to him, the messenger of that insight is a raven. And the next one is a tiger. And it's very similar in, t in terms of the, um, the themes. But the narrator responds to it in a wildly different way. So the first one is, uh, I would say, try to avoid responding like this. And the second one, I would say, uh, it might be a more helpful way to respond. So a few things for the first one, because some of the language is a little bit archaic. Um, the, uh, the raven in Norse mythology is uh, there's two ravens, uh, 
Hugin and Moonin and their thought and memory. So they're the things that you need to reflect. And the raven sits on top of a statue of Pallas. And Pallas is the god of wisdom. God of wisdom and war, actually, which is quite curious. Um, and the last thing you need to know is Seraphim is an, a, a, a seraphim is a rank of angel. It's the highest rank of angel, and it's the it's the level of angels that are that that give um, revelation to human beings. God that they're allowed to communicate truth to humanity. I'd usually use Buddhist um, texts to relay this, but I think sometimes it's useful to remember that. Insight is not Buddhist, and enlightenment is not Buddhist. Compassion and wisdom are not Buddhist. Buddhism is the method. Uh, all those things are human, that they're faculties of consciousness. Yeah. So, and I also really like these. <clears throat> that girl on pose a little bit like a stroppy teenager. And that will come through, I think. <laughs> Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, presently there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping on the chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tap, tap, uh, tap tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Not distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, and vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, Nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger in hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came tapping, and so faintly you came rapping, rapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here, I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness, peering long, I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, the no? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, the no? Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that's something that my window lattice. Let, let me see then what Bharat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. <laughs> it is the wind, and nothing more. Here, uh, open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and a flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon the bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. 
Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven. Ghastly doom, an ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on this night's plutonian shore. And quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marvelled at this ungainly foul to hear discourse so plainly. Its answer, little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on that placid bust spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow, he will leave me, as my friend, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it offers is only stop and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghast, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no symbol expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated over, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating over, she shall press nevermore. Then we thought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepenthe for thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil. Prophet, spirit, bird or devil, with a tempter sent or with a tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted. Tell me, truly, I implore, is there Is there balm in Gilead? Tell me. Tell me, I implore. And quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, by that god we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Eden it shall clasp the sainted maiden whom the angels name the more. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden from the angels named Lenore, and quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or feed, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart 
and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the and his eyes have all the seeming of the demons that he's dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadows on the floor. And my shadow and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. So Poe can be a little melodramatic and self-indulgent. <laughs> <laughs> As can I sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hang on, get out, Poe. <laughs> he's, he's pretty full on. Okay. Yeah, so this is quite a different tone. It's quite a bit shorter as well, you'll be glad to know. It's a tiger by A.D. Hope. The paper tigers roar at noon. The sun is hot, the sun is high. They roar in chorus, not in tune. Their plaintive, savage hunting cry. And when you hear them, stop your ears and clench your lids and bite your tongue. The harmless paper tiger bears strong fascination for the young. His forest is the busy street, his den is the forum and the marsh. He drinks no blood, he tastes no meat. He riddles and corrupts the heart. But when the dusk begins to creep from tree to tree, from door to door, the jungle tiger wakes from sleep and utters his authentic roar. It bursts the night and shakes the stars till one breaks blazing from the sky. Then listen, if to hear it soars your heart's reverberating cry, my child, then put aside your fear and bar the door and walk outside. The real tiger waits you there. His golden eyes will be your guide. And should he spare you in his wrath, the world and all the worlds are yours. And should he leap the jungle path, and clasp you with his bloody jaws. Then say as his divine embrace destroys the mortal parts of you, I too am of that royal race. We do what we are born to do. So what do they have in common? <clears throat> Both narrators have presented an aspect of reality. And that's about it. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe in The Raven, he starts off wanting to con control, titillation, distraction. He's sealed inside his chamber with a, with a little horror book, with Netflix, basically. <laughs> he's, he's, he's in a completely controlled environment and he wants to stay there because um, outside, he says it's December, outside is a stormy Plutonian world. He's terrified of outside. Terrified of going outside of the known. Yeah. A.D. Hope, in contrast, um, he's fed up of the status quo, the, the paper tigers, the, uh, that, um, this sort of poor facsimile of reality, this paper is a two-dimensional representation of reality. It's not, it's not, it has no mass. Uh, the paper tigers drink no blood and they taste no meat, so they're safe. They're safe, but they riddle and corrupt the heart. So Poe settles down into that pretend world and Hope resists it. Hope says, when you hear the paper tigers, clench your lids and bite your tongue. 
He longs for a real experience and to the best that he can, he uh, keeps, he keeps that uh, um, false, well, not false, but he keeps that uh, facsimile of an experience at some distance. And they both hear a call to truth. Uh, hope, because he is longing for that sound, because he is looking for it, because he's fed up of what the, the where he is and thinks there's a there's a more real engagement that he can have, a more authentic engagement. Uh, he hears that call of truth as the roar of a jungle tiger. You know, and a, a jungle tiger is powerful and dangerous and exquisitely beautiful. And it's not under your control. You don't negotiate with a tiger. You completely form your actions around the tiger. You don't you don't hope that it will do what you want it to do. Poe's senses are so dull that when truth comes along, it sounds like a time tapping. And it bet it wakes him, just about wakes him from sleep. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's inconvenient. The knock, is, the knock is inconvenient for him. What they both have in common is that they both have a messenger, a living creature um, that conveys the message or facilitates the, the process. Um, and Poe describes his messenger as grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous. Someone comes and tells you the truth, and that's what you think of them. And he's confused. Uh, he, he has a range of emotions. He thinks it's funny. Um, he mocks it. He dismisses it. He says that it's from some other master who's just taught him these words. Um, eventually, he considers it, and uh, maybe not even intentionally, but he seems to relate it. He, he starts thinking about why that could be, and then Lenore comes to mind. Um, this, this sort of refuge, he's, he's taken refuge in a person and that has not worked out. And um, he needs to come to terms with that somehow, it, it looks. Um, and at that point, the messenger has come in and he's linked it to his actual experience. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not just, ab impermanence is just a, an abstract thing. The crow says impermanence, you know, um, unsatisfactoriness, but he's taken that and applied it to life, to specific experience. And, um, and at that point, divinity comes in, seraphim, who's, uh, who's uh, uh, footfalls tinkle on the tufted floor. I love that, it's wonderful. Um, which is the point in the whole narrative where he completely loses it. He goes completely crazy. Um, he, he sort of sort of cascades into an ever darker, more aggressive situation. Whereas with hope, the jungle tiger is the messenger. Um, and the the, 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 the the call to truth is a roar. And the roar is so loud that it, it, it bursts the night and shakes the stars till one breaks blazing from the sky. So both of these characters, they're having something come in from a higher realm, whether it's God or whether it's the sky, something comes in from outside. Uh, and uh, with, with hope, uh, there's no resistance. He just says it, it, it touches you straight in your heart. It comes straight to your heart. Uh, and at that point, um, uh, my child put aside your fear on bar the door and walk outside. Immediately. There's no, there's no arguing with it. There's no dismissing it. There's no laughing at it. It, it goes in. He's receptive to it. It's, and immediately he's free. 
They both, they both started off inside. Um, but yeah, so uh, Poe resists that. He resists what he knows to be true and it destroys him. It's sort of the, his, his energy keeps going up and up and up until he's frantic, at which point he sort of realizes that, that uh, reality is not something you can pick a fight with and win. Mm. Uh, and at which point he's crushed. And it's not that reality has crushed him, it's that he's, he's completely expended everything in him fighting it. Um, you know, ignoring reality will take you to difficult places. And that's one thing, but picking a fight with reality, it'll, it'll take you to bits, you know. Um, you, in doing so, you're in conflict with every atom in the universe and in you, yeah? Um, and so Poe remains in the room that he started in, probably a bit worse than he started off in, because at least before he had his, um, he had his delusions, whereas now he's not, not got them. He's sort of made a half a leap to insight where he's neither really gaining comfort in samsara, nor is he actually uh, uh, forming a new understanding uh, from that. And so he's in this middle bit, whereas hope, he walks free and he's happy whether he owns the world or whether he's swallowed whole by it. I love those poems. Yeah. Um, so the last bit, I've stopped, I've stopped to it. I've been good. Um, so life is inconsistent, it's imperfect, and it's insecure. Um, if you can accept the change, if you can accept the imperfection, and you can accept the insecurity, you accept life, because that's what life is like. Yeah? Um, you, you become alive by becoming those things, because life is that. Um, and we, we think, you know, things like unsatisfactory, we think it's negative, but it's actually like, it's, uh, it's a damn relief. Uh, if things are unsatisfying, it's, you're, not, you're not doing something wrong. <laughs> Such a such a damn relief, you know. I've I've felt for so long that you know, unless I go around with a big smile on my face all of the time, there's something up. It's like, well, who on earth told you that that's what life was like? Why are you expecting that? That's a daft thing to expect. <laughs> so, uh, the Buddhist center has a reputation as a nice, safe, positive, relaxed place, friendly place, and that is great, but that's not why we're here. That is a condition, that, that is a, an environment uh, that you can be a bit like Edgar Allan Poe and you can sort of get nice and comfortable in, or you can use that stability, the resources, the connection, the combined wisdom, effort, and communication, and commitment that's here to go looking for tigers. That's what this place is for, yeah? We're here to meet tigers. Um, so uh, enjoy the niceness uh, and the stability, uh, the relative stability that's here, uh, but use that to explore, use that to as a springboard, let's say. I'd just like to leave you with the last three verses of the tiger. Tiger time. My child, then put aside your fear and bar the door and walk outside. The real tiger waits you there. His golden eyes will be your guide. And should he spare you in his wrath? The world and all the worlds are yours. And should he leave the jungle path and clasp you in his bloody jaws, then say as his divine embrace destroys the mortal parts of you, 
I too am of that royal race who do what we are born to do. Thank you.